genealogy and is also an expert in genealogical research in the Northeastern Louisiana area. Um, she's the host of Black Progen Live, an innovative web show focused on people of color genealogy and family history. Uh, she's also a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, a charter member of the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage, and a member of the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, she also has uh, many accolades, and we're just really happy to have her today. So I'd like to welcome Nika Smith. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me, Suzanne. <laughs> Wow, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you about one of my favorite, favorite, favorite topics. Um, I feel like of course, if you've been doing genealogy for any amount of time, right? You know, many of us started, you know, through traditional genealogy research, right? Through looking at records. Some of you may have started, you know, through microfilm, the old school days, you know, where you used to get crank arm, you know, crank and microfilm and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then we, you know, moved or evolved into the, the digital space that we're in. But there are so many people who are coming to genealogy and family history research as a result of DNA testing. And um, there may be some of you who may be completely scared about jumping into, you know, DNA testing, right? Like, what is it? How can I use it? All that kind of stuff. And I'm here to tell you, as someone who is an avid user, um, someone who has more than 100 people tested on just one branch of my family, how amazing and how impactful genetic genealogy is when combined with your traditional genealogy research. So have no fear. Ask me any question. No question is stupid. There's no such thing as a stupid question, at least for me, right? You don't know unless you ask. So feel free to use the, um, the Q&A section so that we can track your questions and we make sure that, that, that you get the answers um, and the, the, the content and stuff that you need to move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can guys can see my presentation. All right, so welcome to the Family DNA Project. Um, this is one of my favorite presentations to give. Um, I love it because as I mentioned just, just a second ago, people are super intimidated by DNA. Um, and I feel like there's almost this kind of um, really wide chasm in genealogy or space between the folks that do genetic genealogy very, really well and the people who do traditional genealogy really well. When really we should all be kind of coming to the center and using both for, for all of our purposes. And if you don't hear me say it more than a hundred times during this presentation, hear me now. You don't have DNA without traditional genealogy and you don't have traditional genealogy without DNA. Yes, you can actively pursue the two separately, but they won't work as well for you unless you dip your toe into either one of them. So let's go ahead and jump into the content. All right, so we're gonna start off at the ground level, really easy, um, you know, just definitions, right? Let's get a handle on what exactly we're talking about. And this is, this is a definition that's provided by the International Society of Genetic Genealogy or ISOG, right? They are a uh, society that was established, you know, to um, really set the standard for genetic genealogy and the study of it. And so this definition is for autosomal DNA, and it's a term used in genetic genealogy to describe DNA, which is inherited from the autosomal chromosomes. Again, it's genetic genealogy, right? It's a term used in genetic genealogy to describe what is inherited from the autosomal chromosomes. And what an autosome is, is the numbered chromosomes, right? As opposed to the sex chromosomes. When you're talking sex chromosomes, you're talking an X and an X for a woman and an X and a Y for a male, right? So we're talking autosomes, right? Autosomes are not the sex chromosomes. They are the numbered pairs. Humans have 22 pairs of autosomes and pay special attention to the word pairs. A lot of times when you get on DNA systems such as family tree DNA or 23andMe, you'll see, you know, they give you the ability to do matching, right? Or, or comparisons where you look at your DNA and then you also look at the DNA of the person that you're doing the comparison to, to see where you all match up, right? Someone may ask you a question like, well, how much DNA is it? And on how many, uh, uh, you know, how many centimorgans or CM, right? Right. You may have seen that 
term before. It's not centi you know, centimeters like we, you know, we use for our typical measurement, but in genetic genealogy, it's a centimorgan. And so when you're doing those comparisons, you got to remember that your chromosomes are in pairs. And so let's look at an example of what this looks like. Looks like a pretty picture, right? That's my, those are my autosomes. <laughs> and you see a lot of pink and blue. And this screenshot is from 23andMe. On 23andMe, you have the ability to break your you know, your ethnicity down on the chromosomal level. You have the ability to, um, it, it, they, I think they're unique in doing this. On Family Tree DNA, you can do matching where it sort of mimics this, but on 23andMe is where they give you the ability to look at, you know, the, the ethnicities, the, the racial groups um, that you have lineage tied to based on the algorithm or what I call the fancy, uh, the fancy recipe or ingredient list that each site has, right? You gotta remember each DNA system has a different set of criteria that they compare your DNA against. Every site is not the same. So if you test with Ancestry DNA, or if you test with 23andMe, or Family Tree DNA, or My Heritage, or Living DNA, your percentages are not going to come out exactly the same, right? And in this example, all of the pink for me represents my African DNA. That's my African DNA is all the pink. All the blue is all of my European DNA. And all of the orange is my Asian or Native American DNA. Now you'll also see deeper blues and deeper pinks and those still are, are ascribed to those larger groups. But remember, we're, we're talking about pairs, right? Notice each area, um, you know, each, each autosome, right, has two, it's a pair. The reason why, one comes from your mother and one comes from your father. So keep this in mind when you're doing comparisons, because sometimes it'll appear if you have a group of three people and you share DNA with one person and it's in one spot and you share DNA with another person and it appears in the same spot. And then when you compare those two people together, they don't share any DNA. It's because the DNA that they share with you is on one part of your, you know, one, one of the pairs and the other pair. OK, so some of you may have already encountered that in doing comparisons. I don't understand it. It's three people. They look like they match in the same spot from here to here. But when I compare them, they sure no DNA. And it's because you've got a pair. One matches on your father's side. One matches on your mother's side. Right. That's how that works. Right. One line is mom. One line is dad. OK, so those are my autosomes. Yours may look different, but you still have them. Right now, when you do the comparisons on 23andMe between you and another person, this is the chart that they show you. Notice the difference. It doesn't account for pairs at all. And this was a deliberate choice because it gets to be confusing, right? If you have, if they would have displayed it in pairs, people would be like, I don't get, I don't understand what, what? So, so to make it easier for people to understand what they were looking at, they just made it one line. But what you need to realize is that these one lines are technically split into two, right? And this will make more sense um, in some of the examples that I'll, I'm getting ready to show you. So here's an example of me and my mom. Right? Me and my mother share 3,693 centimorgans, right? Of course, she's my mom. She's supposed to share DNA with me on every chromosome because she's my mom, right? Half of my autosome, half of my pair on chromosome one through 22 comes from her, right? And, and what I get from her is an amalgamation of what she got from her parents. Now, I have a sister, and what my sister gets from my mom may not be exactly what I got from my mom. The only way it is is if we're identical twins, right? And then when you factor in the fact that me and my sister only share my mother as a common relation, we have different dads, that also drills things down even further, right? So, so the cocktail, you know, or recipe, let's say we're making, what are we making today? We can make macaroni and cheese, right? Usually I use a mojito as my example. <laughs> but if we're making macaroni and cheese, right, I might want Gouda in mine, right? So my macaroni and cheese recipe for my mother includes Gouda, but my sister's has more mozzarella in it. Think of your DNA in that way, right? The cocktail that my mom gave me has a little bit more of this. 
the cocktail that my mom gave my sister has a little bit more of that, right? And then when you factor in half relationships, that also alters things as well because it's only one person being the source of the connection. Since me and my sister have different dads, the DNA me and her have in common comes from our mother because she's the central unifying figure between us, right? So you, you got to think in terms like that. In fact, if you have scenarios within your own family where you've got people who um, are related only through one parent, in some ways genetically, that is better than if you have people that are related through both. Why? Because you can eliminate from contention an entire branch of a family and drill down on only where the common relation is, right? So let's expand this out to three generations. This is me and my mother in purple, as you saw on the last screen, and me and my maternal grandmother in orange. Now this is my mom's mom. So this is three generations of what DNA comparisons look like, right? You've got me and my mom, 3,693 centimorgans, right? On 31 segments, segments meaning the individual segments, right, of DNA. And then for my grandmother, I share 2,093 centimorgans on 35 segments. Now take a guess as to why I don't have as much orange as I do pink, because I'm fully my grandmother's child, right? That's my mom's mom. That's my direct female ancestor. So what accounts for those gray areas on that second line with my grandmother? got to think about it. Why is there gray? Why is my grandmother not taking up those the entire area? Well, the question is that accounts for my grandfather, right? My mother is her father and her mother. So in the areas that I don't share DNA with my grandmother, but me and my mother share DNA, right? For example, that would be here, here, right? You see the gray? Look at all of chromosome 18 that I got from my mother is all from her father. There is not a single piece of chromosome 18 that I got from my grandmother. Meaning that if me and my mom share DNA with somebody and it's on that chromosome, I know automatically that our connection comes from my grandfather because I share no DNA with my grandmother on that exact same spot. So if you have a scenario where you have, you can't test people because they have passed away, this is a great way to do this is to use the living people and then use deductive reasoning or right or where you don't see something showing up as a way to, you know, to kind of um, in, in some ways recreate, recreate them right or raise them from the dead genetically. All right, so let's move forward mitochondrial DNA or a mitochondrial DNA, DNA test or MT DNA test traces a person's matrilineal or mother's line ancestry using the DNA in his or her mitochondria. Okay. MT DNA is passed down by the mother unchanged to all of her children, both male and female, right? Mitochondrial DNA goes from the mother or from me, right? Or mom to all of her kids her male and female kids, right? And therefore, a male or a female can take a mitochondrial DNA test, okay? And the reason why that this, this can be done is, remember, in order for a man to be a man genetically, right, they've got to inherit a Y chromosome from their father. They have to inherit an X from their mother, right? If they inherited a, y, a, a X from their dad, they wouldn't be genetically male. They would be female, right? So that's the differentiator, right? So if you are a male and you had a sister and you were trying to figure out your direct, you know, um, your mitochondrial ancestors, right? Um, and, and if your sister has passed away, you yourself can do a DNA test to find out where the mitochondrial DNA on, on your family tree came from, right? So let's look at this as an example, right? So for empty DNA, right? it can come from, it's direct, right? Straight up, okay? It's, it's mom's, 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 mom, unbroken chain, okay? And a man or woman can take this test. But the difference between MT DNA and X DNA is this. There are no male to male hand-me-downs, right? Because in order for a man to be a man, 
a Y chromosome must be handed down to his son in order to make him genetically male. So in my instance on my tree, right, we've got to eliminate my father's father and that whole side because my father inherited a Y chromosome. That Y chrom chromosome was inherited through his father's father's father, right? Now, if my, you know, if I was dealing with my aunt, my dad's sister, oh, we could pull X DNA and it would come from my grandfather and his mother, right? Because it's a man, you know, woman passing down to a man, right? Or to her son. But in this case, no, for my dad, his whole line that's all through his father is completely removed from, from, from contention. In fact, I encourage all of you who are watching today to mark out who contributes to your X DNA on your, on your family tree. Print out a pedigree and literally shade over or color over, right? Or maybe highlight those who contribute or you can do the opposite and remove those who don't contribute to your X DNA. So dad to dad, his side gone, right? Any other direct male, that means my maternal grandfather, his dad's side is removed. Because remember, we can't have male to male for X DNA, okay? And remember, X DNA is, is specific to the X, right? Autosomes are one through 22, X DNA is just this, okay? We also have to eliminate, right, one of my grandmother's lines, right, from her father to his father, because that's another male-to-male -male hand me down. Now, here's the other piece of this, okay? Notice that there are still men involved in this scenario. The reason why is because they birthed a daughter, meaning that their X chromosome was passed down to them from their mother. And it was, it was direct from her. So any DNA that, for example, my great-grandfather Theodore passed down to my grandmother automatically comes from his mother because there's no way it can be his, um, it's no way it can be his father because he's male. It just doesn't work out that way, okay? Um, and so you, you, you know, you've got to, you've got to remember that, right? Same scenario, right? Any of my grandfathers, my, my great grandfather through my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, right? She gets X DNA from him, can't be through his father, has to come through his mother. It's directly from her. So if you use deductive reasoning in your matching and your trees, right? You see how if somebody matches you on the X chromosome, you can drill back very quickly, especially if you've established that the relationship is through a male in your family, because you know exactly where that X DNA came from, right? The dad isn't involved. It's the mother, right? Now it gets a little bit more hairy when you get into the moms, because the mom you know, like in this scenario with my great grandmother, of course, her ex is a combination of her mother and her father, right? But when we go back another generation, we can rule the men out of being as as a, a point, you know, a, a point of the source of 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 relation because there's no male to male situations happening, right? So here's an example of what X DNA between a mother and a child looks like. Of course, my entire X chromosome you know, my pair from my mother has to, has to, the whole thing has to be filled up. Has to be, right? Because it's being passed down from her, right? It's, it's, it's the amalgamation from her. It's, you know, it's her, remember, she's got a pair of chromosomes and, you know, through the mixture of making her macaroni and cheese that became me <laughs> with the Gouda, right? She has passed down an, an exact copy, right? But when we look at this with a third generation added, Notice again, the gray areas that are not attributed to my grandmother. Remember the pink is my mother. The orange is my grandmother, my mother's mother, right? If I was doing a comparison between my mom and my grandmother, of course, you know, my mom's whole X chromosome is going to be taken up just like mine is with hers in this example, because it's my mother and my grandmother. But because we've got to factor my grandfather into this, we notice, right, this area here at the bottom in the gray, that's all my grandfather. So I just share, and in some ways, visually, you can see, it looks like I took a little bit more from my maternal grandfather from my mom's ex DNA than I did my maternal grandmother. 
just a little bit more. So if anyone shares with just me and my mom in that one spot, I know it's from him. And then remember, he's male. So that removes his father's side of the family from being in contention as the source of me being related to another person. It has to come from his mother's side because she passed down an X chromosome. And I hope I'm making sense to you all, especially when it comes to the pairs and the X chromosomal DNA, especially if you have identified that somebody is a DNA match to you through a male family member of yours. You can jump back, you know, to previous generations much more quickly. Now, moving forward again, Y chromosome DNA test or Y DNA test is a genealogical DNA test which is used to explore a man's patrilineal or direct father's line ancestry, right? So we're dealing, instead of, you know, mtDNA, where it's mother's, 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 mother, right? And why we're dealing with father's, 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 father, right? You have to have a Y chromosome to do this test, meaning that it doesn't work like how mtDNA works, where a man can test for his mother or his father, you know, his mother's side, right? And a woman can test for her mother's side. But in this scenario, only men can, genetically men, can take the Y chromosome test, right? And the Y chromosome, like the patrilineal surname or the, the, you know, the, the surname from the father's side, passes down virtually unchanged from father to son. Now, of course, there's a monkey wrench in that if there's a scenario where a father, biological father, um, who, or who is believed to be a biological father is not the biological father, right? So because I don't have a Y chromosome, I have to show my father's side of the family <laughs> because I don't have a Y chromosome, right? So how would this work for my dad's side, right? That means that everybody on his tree that is not related to him directly through his paternal line, his father's father's father, none of their DNA is being picked up through a Y DNA test. It's not, right? It's just direct paternal line going all the way back from my dad to his father, Jack, to his father, James, to his father, Benjamin, to his father, Robert, right? It's that direct line, okay? So when you're thinking, remember, when you're thinking mtDNA, it's direct maternal line. Y-DNA is direct paternal line. X-DNA is, remember, mother to either a male or female child, right? But not from a male to a male right? That's not how that works. That's, and you know, when you move beyond that into looking at the autosomes or the, the numbered chromosomes, right? Where you may share DNA with somebody, those are broken into pairs. You get one from your mother and you get one from your father. All right. So before we get really deep into how to organize your project, right? To get the most bang for your buck when it comes to your, you know, genetic genealogy stuff, we've got to do some house cleaning when it comes to um, genealogy. And sometimes I feel like some of us who have been in this for a long time, we sometimes forget that we had to start somewhere. I think sometimes we forget that there are people who were just beginning the process who haven't been involved in this as long as we have, who, you know, just, we just forget that people are new and they don't know everything, right? And so this is, this is, this is your come, come to the genealogy, you know, church. (laughs) This is, this is that talk, right? For that. So here's the question that I have for you all. Does everyone here know all four of their grandparents? Now, for some of you, this may be preposterous. Like you're really asking if I know the names and I've verified information for all four of my grandparents. But no, it's not a preposterous question because if you're an adoptee, you may not know the names of all four of your biological grandparents. You may have your adopted family, right? And that's still your family. But you may come to the table not knowing who all four of your grandparents are. And if there's a scenario where you were told who your ancestor was, and then you did DNA testing and you found out that that individual was not your ancestor or not your grandparent, it would be very easy for you to find out that you are not, you don't have the names of all four of your grandparents, okay? Same thing, if you keep going down the line, each generation 
the number of ancestors doubles. So your four grandparents turn into eight great grandparents, right? Because they have a set of parents. So each time you keep going through the generations, you're going to keep doubling. By the time you get to your great, great grandparents, you have 16 of those, right? When you get to your three times or your great, great, great grandparent, you've got 32 of those. And then when you get to your four times great grandparents or your great, 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 great grandparents, you have 64 of those. How many of you all have all 124 of the names of those, those people going literally every single person going back to your four times great grandparents? And even if you do, have you verified that everybody is correct? either through documentation or through DNA or a combination of both. The majority of people in genealogy, even people who have been in this for an extended period of time, right? They don't even have all of this information. They don't. So consider this your challenge, right? And some of this is, for me, it's aspirational. I have a grandfather that I just have a first name for. I don't know his parents, but I know his great his grandparents because their descendants are so well documented in my DNA results and my mother's DNA results. But the thing is, we can't come to the table getting irritated with people who are brand new to genealogy or genetic genealogy and and, and their introduction to it is is the DNA, you know, DNA, right? Like that's how they first came into it and you know we get flippant or almost like, you know, uh, uh, just obnoxious in some ways. Oh, you don't know, you know, it, no, that's why they took the test, <laughs> right? So keep this at the forefront. If you don't have all the details, don't expect for everybody who's sending you a message to have all the details. If your tree isn't complete with all 124 people, don't expect for your matches to have everybody going back to 124 people. In fact, don't expect for people to have a tree. Because remember, some of them may not know these names. And they took the test to try to find it out. And for you as the person who's interested in genealogy, that is where you step in and you help that person instead of expecting them to, to gather all the resources and thoughts and, and trial and error that you've gained as a researcher, right? That's, that's where you step in and that's where you help. That's where you, you aid the cause, right? Here's the second step of this. So even if you do have all 124 people, how organized have you been with your records? Can you get back to everything, right? We're talking, we're talking from the library today, right? The librarian is gonna, is gonna drill into you about sources and being able to go back to the original source of where you found something, right? And this is so important when it comes to genetic genealogy because you all, the leads on how you're connected to these people are oftentimes hiding on documents you already have. Your DNA matches, um, you know, could be, th their, their ancestors could be the witnesses on a marriage license for your direct ancestors. Your DNA matches ancestors may be living in the household next to your people on a census. Your DNA matches uh, ancestor may be the informant on a death certificate. But if you can't grab the documents that you have that are a part of your project and your research, if you can't, if you don't have that readily accessible to say, you know what, wasn't there a Parker? I remember seeing a Parker on, on Uncle Jeremiah's death certificate. Is it the same person that, that is on the same family tree as this DNA match that reached out to me? If you can't get to that stuff and you can't go back to where you got the source of your information from, it makes the process much harder to figure out. The other thing you need to be aware of is what test you've taken and what it offers. Okay. And I think this is probably one of the biggest pitfalls that people fall into is because they may see a sale. We all love a sale. We all love a coupon, right? I don't know anybody who's going to say, oh, you know, I'm not going to take that thing for 50% off. I'm going to pay full price. I don't know a single person who's going to do that. Okay. And when you do DNA testing, you've got to be aware of what each company offers, right? Whereas Ancestry DNA has the largest testing pool, meaning that more people have taken Ancestry DNA than any other 
you know, a DNA kit on the market, right? Where they have that and they've got inclusive populations, meaning that when you take the test, you're not just going to get um, results that are just Africa, right? Like you may get Ghana, Benin, Togo, right? It's not just going to be where Europe is broken down really well, where you, you're going to see inclusive populations from all over the world. Where you get that, where 23andMe has the second most testers that it, or people who have tested on their website, right? 23andMe has a chromosome browser, like which I was showing you, you know, where you compare DNA between you and other people, where Ancestry does not offer that. Ancestry's alternative to that is shared matches, right? And you'll see a little bit of this in a second when we when I get deeper into, um, com you know, comparisons and all that other kind of stuff, right? My heritage, vice, you know, vice versa. They, they've got. They've got, uh, you know, they've got a chromosome browser, but they don't have very inclusive populations. So if you're someone who's looking to get those percentages and you want to drill down in a particular way, they aren't very inclusive, um, unfortunately, right? Remember, this is the, the algorithm, you know, that's the way that it's referred to, the reference panel, right, that each company has is different. It's proprietary, meaning Ancestry's, you know, algorithm is specifically Ancestry's, 23andMe's is theirs, and my heritage and family tree DNA, right? And so you've got to look at it from that perspective. That's why your results are not always the same. Some people will order all the kits and notice, well, they said I had more British than, you know, no, it's because of how, what they, what they, what they measure your stuff against is different. It's not the same, right? Um, the other thing to consider is that not everyone offers MT DNA tests and Y DNA tests. There's only two companies that do that. So if you're trying to get your direct paternal line or your direct, you know, maternal line, you can only get that information from, um, you know, matching in that way from Family Tree DNA. That's the only product that's on the market that does that right now, right? When you're looking at additional companies like African Ancestry that do direct female and direct male, you are getting, you know, an identified group in, in Africa that your ancestor may come from, but you don't get any of the DNA matching that you get with the other companies. And the reason why that is, you know, it's a blessing and it's not so much of a blessing is because, especially if you're doing African ancestor research and you're looking at ancestors who were enslaved and you're seeing DNA that's, that's you know, DNA matches that have ancestry that's coming from a far flung area. Your family is from, you know, let's say they're, they're from Northeast Louisiana and you're seeing DNA matches that are all from North Carolina in this one isolated location. You can look at each other's trees. You can even see that you guys share DNA with each other on African ancestry. You can can't do that at all. They do not offer matching. So be clear on what the kit offers. Don't just say, oh, it's half off, right? Because Black Friday is coming up, y'all. It'll be here next month, right? Kits are going to go on sale again. Be clear on what each company offers and what you need for your particular project before you go saying, oh, girl, I got a deal. And then you get the kit and it's not, <laughs> and it's not what you needed, right? Especially for your particular project, okay? So let's talk about setting up your your particular DNA project, right? You want to do the best possible thing that you possibly can for your D, you know, for your genealogy project, right? You've got the paper down, you've got all that stuff, or maybe you started with DNA and you're trying to get the paper trail to align with what you've done genetically, right? Here's here are my suggestions on how to set up your particular family DNA project. Step number one. You want to beat your tree like a dead horse. Now, some of you might be equestrian. I'm using that as a euphemism. Please don't mean, you know, don't think that <laughs> I'm saying that I want you to beat an animal. No, but you want to make sure your tree is the most well-researched you could possibly get it. That doesn't mean that it has the nicest box and bow and, and you, you know, everything is done and it's sourced. No, because it takes people years to get to that place. And, and even then they're not all done. Remember, do they have all 124 people? Most folks do not, right? But you want to do your due diligence on your family tree. Sometimes what I notice in working with people is that they will only research their direct ancestors, right? I'm only going to do my mom and, and my dad and, you know, their parents. I'm not going to research my aunts, my uncles on various generations of the family. 
there's a problem with that when you move into genetic genealogy because everyone is not going to be related to you through your direct people. Eventually you'll get there, but it may be that somebody is, is a DNA match and it's because they match, they share DNA with you. Um, you know, their, their grandmother is the sister of your grandfather, right? You know, whether it's the actual grandparents or it's a great, right? But if you don't, if you haven't cataloged that, that, that grandmother's name or that aunt's name, how do you even know who's involved, right? So you need to go up to your direct ancestors. You need to go out to their descendants and not just your direct people, right? With autosomal DNA testing, this is both sides of your family. It's not like that's the difference between autosomal DNA testing and gender-based testing or, you know, uh, mtDNA or Y-DNA. Autosomal DNA tests, which is literally the majority of the DNA tests that are on the market, the results apply to both sides of your family, not one side or the other. So if you order a 23andMe or an Ancestry or Living DNA or MyHeritage, those results apply to both sides of your family, both. Right. But if you do the direct testing for Y and the direct testing for, you know, mtDNA, those are direct lines. Remember, fathers, 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 mothers, mothers, mothers. But the majority of the folks that are listening today and the majority of the people have tested and the majority of kids that are out there are for both sides. You have and then you have to sift through figuring out which side of the family your, your matches come to you from. And this is this is why we're talking about this today. So this is why you've got to research those what we call collateral relatives, those people who are the siblings of your ancestors, because not everyone is going to come from your great grandparents. Someone can come from their siblings. You also have to research down into their descendants, right? You may know that generation because these may be people that you grew up with, but what about their kids? Their kids are more likely the people who are DNA testing than those folks that you know. But if you just focus on your direct people, you'll completely miss how somebody is related to you. You also want to make sure that you document facts and extract the breadcrumbs. What do I mean by that? Going back to that example that I gave where you have a DNA match, they have the surname Jackson or whatever it is, and you remember that on one of your ancestors' death certificates, there's a Jackson, and you didn't know who this Jackson was. You had no clue. Like, you know, the informant or the person who provided the information on the death certificate, you know, that that's went and reported the person died was a Jackson. And for years, you've been trying to figure out how in the world, well, who is this person? And why were they, why were they reporting that my great grandmother died? Well, if you haven't extracted all of that data from that death certificate, if you've just kept it as a piece of paper or as a digital document and haven't really gone through each field to figure out who someone is or maybe their potential connection or all of those details, you're going to miss that that Jackson is your DNA matches ancestor and using deductive reasoning and looking at about how, you know, how much DNA you and the DNA match share the descendant of that Jackson, you'll find out how they're related to you, right? Great example here is my grandmother's birth certificate. It's delayed because when she was born, she didn't have a birth certificate. So later when the Social Security Administration, you know, came to be and she needed to get Social Security benefits, she had to get a delayed birth certificate issued. Now, here's the question, right? Most people are paying attention to all this stuff at the top. What's the name? What's the birthday? Where were they born? What are the name of the parents, right? But the juicy stuff is down here. This affidavit of personal knowledge, who is Wilbert Rogers in relation to Lois? The person whose birth certificate it is, right? What about, where, you know, other things like there's a family Bible record. Who has that Bible? Where is that at? right? You got to really process and synthesize all the information there because there's clues. And I'm telling you, a lot of times your DNA matches, their ancestors are hiding on stuff like this. For me, the majority of the time when I'm looking at matches, they're not, they're not coming from um, my, like the next door neighbor on the census. It's always an informant. It's, it's something else. It's not always the obvious thing. So additional steps. Develop your list of research questions and really be audacious, really be bold with this. What are you trying to figure out, right? It could be as simple as, I just want to know who my grandfather is. Or it could be, you know, I want to trace my family's history throughout slavery, right? Or it could be, you know, I just want to get back as far as possible. Develop your list of research questions. 
And the reason why I suggest that you do this is then you can formulate a strategy on how you're going to use genetic genealogy along with traditional genealogy to get those questions answered. Right. When you are deliberate, when you put it out into the atmosphere that, that you're being deliberate and you're being intentional, it you know, it's in some ways it's like the, the universe conspires and you you get you you get maybe an answer or a partial answer for what you're seeking. Right. And then the next thing I suggest is selecting your favorite four. And and this is to me what I think is really key in genetic genealogy. A lot of folks think, oh, I'll spend, you know, a hundred dollars, or if you got the 50% off <laughs> that I just talked about, I'll just spend, you know, I'll spend $39, get a kid, and that's all I need to do, right? You said it's both sides of my family, so then that means I could trace everybody. But what if you've done that, what you know is that when you go into these systems, you're like, well, which side of the family is this this really large French percentage coming from? Or wait, this says I'm, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish. Like which side of the family is that coming from, right? And the only way you know is if you deliberately test people in your family that are, you know, that you know are related to you on paper and, and or if those folks have already tested in the system. And then you can look at, do comparisons between who you all share DNA with or how your percentages are, um, showing up to determine where that mysterious French or the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry came from. So here's my suggestion on who to search for for your favorite four, right? I always suggest testing people who are descendants of your shared great grandparents. My suggestion, if you don't already have a bunch of family members in the system, or if you're trying to build a project of your own, is to test known descendants of your great grandparents. These are people who are your second cousins. They are the children of your parents' first cousins, right? A lot of times people want to make your second cousin, you know, your first cousin's child. You know, that's my second cousin. That's not how that works because there's a generational separation between you and your, your, your first cousin's child. Okay, your first cousin's child is your first cousin once removed. We're talking the same people on the same generation. And if we're talking great grandparents, these are people who share the same set of great grandparents to you. In this situation that I'm showing you, that means I would choose a, a person who is related to me through James B. Sewell and Teresa Holmes. That means I would choose another person who was a descendant of Theodore Rogers and Clara Allen. I would then choose another person who comes from this unknown set of great grandparents that I have. And then I would choose a descendant of Louis Atlas and Susie Lee. Now, there's a deliberate reason why I'm suggesting you test these people, right? You can test your parents, you can test your siblings. But anyone that you have in common with folks that are descendants from your great grandparents, right? Any DNA match that you have, right? those folks are going to be related to you through that shared set of great grandparents. And it's even better if you only share one of them versus the other, because then that removes a whole side of your tree, right? From contention as to how you're being um, related to a person, right? So moving forward, determine the test that you need to administer to, you know, potentially get the, the answers you want, right? This goes back to making sure you're clear on what each company offers in terms of DNA results, right? Or, or matching or chromosome browser, whatever your specific needs are, make sure the company that you have solicited or that you, you know, that you're giving business to gives you exactly what you need for what you're trying to do, right? So you aren't disappointed, right? You also want to make sure that you brief your favorite four people that you've decided to test. Um, you know, if, if, if you have an identified second cousins, if you've got a great aunt or uncle living or somebody that is a sibling to a grandparent or an older family member, elder, right, who is generationally closer to your ancestors, select some of them, right? You, whoever you test, make sure you brief them on what you're doing and make sure that they're clear on all of it, right? Because here's the thing. We all weren't around when people were conceived and a lot of secret scandals and lies are coming to light as a result of DNA testing. So you want to make sure that anyone, even if you buy the kits, you want to make sure that people are clear that there's a, there's a potential that some stuff may come out that they aren't aware of. Okay. And this is just being a good steward and, and, and being a good cousin and a good family member, making sure that they're prepared for these things. Some people may not care. Some people do. 
right? But you, you, you would just, you would be remiss if you didn't consider these things, okay? And then of course, order the kids, administer them, and wait. So this is when we get into the fun part. This is where, ta-da, right? This is where the fun begins. So once you get the test done, okay, yeah, whoa, let's go, right? Don't you wish we could be like this right now? Every time I see this picture, I get stressed out now because I'm like, they're standing close. Nobody's got a mask on. <laughs> we used to be like this, so carefree. It's almost like we all like, I don't know. It's like we all went to college and realized we were 18 and there was no one to wash our clothes anymore. <laughs> it's just crazy, but we're, we'll get back. We'll get back. So here's an example. This, this is an example of what my, my DNA matches look like on Ancestry, right? If some people, you may have done the test, you may have looked at the percentages, but you may not have ventured into the part of the website that does the DNA matching. And if you haven't, you've got a job ahead of you because there's so much more available there than in the percentages. Why? Remember, it's looking at both sides of your family. So it's determining a degree of relation between you and everyone else, all the others and millions of people who have already DNA testing. In this example, you see my mom is tested. She's up there at the top, right? Then I've got someone listed as a first cousin with the initials RM, someone listed as a second cousin with the initials JDT, and someone else listed with the initials SC, listed as between a first to second cousin. Now, here's where I remind you all that with the DNA matching, right? With DNA, it's not every single first cousin shares you know, 699 cinnamorgans. That's not how DNA works. Remember, this is like, remember my sister has more mozzarella in her macaroni and cheese and I have more Gouda, right? It's very variable, right? But for the most part, you can stick people into buckets of relation based on ranges, okay? So in this scenario that you all are looking at, yes, my mom is my mom, but that person listed as first, listed as first cousin with me with the initials RM is actually my dad's first cousin. Now, in the example I just gave before, remember, if she's my dad's first cousin, that makes her my first cousin once removed. And her children are my second cousins, right? The situation with JDT that's right underneath that person is listed as a second cousin or between first and second cousin. She is also a first cousin to one of my parents, not my dad, but my mom. So that means that she is also a first cousin once removed. My common relation with her are my mother's grandparents that they have in common or my great grandparents. Same in the situation with RM, right? The other clue that you get is if you have a parent tested on Ancestry or 23andMe, it will tell you which side of the family the, the match is on. You see it's got labeled mother's side because my mother is tested, right? Now, if we go down here to SC, right? They're listed as between a first and a second cousin, which is true, but this is only through one grandparent. So uh, going back over this again, if you've got a parent tested, make sure that you list or you look at the list of matches and you, and if you have a parent tested, it'll say mother's side or father's side. Sometimes if your family's from a small area, you may see mother and father's side or both sides, right? The system will tell you these things, but relationships, regardless of what they are on paper, they have ranges of DNA that are shared. It's not exact. So um, a first cousin, um, a grandparent, um, um, you know, uh, aunts and uncles, right? There's a bunch of different combinations where those close family members may be identified in the system as between a first and a second cousin, and they're not. It's actually an aunt or an uncle, right? But the only way that you know the true relationship is if you do the genealogical work to dig into how folks are related to you, okay? Here's the other thing. Because these people represent ancestors in my tree, I really shouldn't be looking at them as just their names, right? In my list, and you see the example that I just gave, right? This is how they would appear. They would have their names. But the way that I look at them is the common relation that I have between me and them, right? So RM is really my shared, my set of great grandparents, her grandparents, the, the set, same set of grandparents she shared with my dad. The other first cousin once removed that was JDT, she represents my great grandparents on my mother's side, right? This, the person below that SC is really my great, is my grandfather. That's it. Because my, anybody that I have in common with him is purely from my grandfather. 
because we only share him as a relation, right? So let's look at this in, in terms of my tree, okay? If we're looking at the Fab Four, those four people that I just showed you, RM stands proxy for that set of great grandparents. So anyone that her and I have in common is a shared match, our relation is gonna come through one of those great grandparents for me or grandparents for her. There's another match that I have that was further down the page, right? He's standing proxy for the second set of great grandparents that I have on my father's side. SC represents just the great grandparents that I have through my grandfather because we only have that relation. And then JDT represents that set of great grandparents. Now you see how I've just completely skipped over my parents. It's not like I don't care about them, but if you're really trying to trace back further, you've got to do targeted testing. So then that way you can eliminate people from being the source of contention or this, the source of the relations between you and someone else. Okay. Now here's the best part. The four people that you choose, if you choose a, you know, a, a second cousin, first cousin once removed, you know, or first cousin of your parents, they really stand proxy for six people. Because the DNA that they inherited from that same set of folks you all have in common, it came from their ancestors. Does that make sense? So RM not only represents my great grandparents, but she represents in DNA, she represents four of my great great grandparents because our DNA is an amalgamation of all six of those people. Remember my, my macaroni and cheese got more Gouda, right? In this scenario, maybe RM's you know, uh, uh, macaroni and cheese, she uses cheddar cheese soup from Campbell's, right? We both got DNA from all six of these people, but our mixture is different. So she may pick up different characteristics from these six folks than I do, right? I may pick it up from the other side of the family. That's why you have to test different people and you have to specifically target certain, certain family members, right? SV, same thing. He's not just my great grandparents, but remember the DNA we share comes directly from them and then also from their parents, but it's in different concentrations, right? In the scenario with SC through just the father's side, right? Remember, he just connects through my grandfather. It's the same thing. And then when you go with JDT, that's it too. So now you're like, well, wait a minute. Okay, this is interesting. So now you're, you're saying that the DNA that we have, it, it's actually there. We share DNA with folks that were, were born in the 1800s. Yes, that's how, that's how all those autosomes are made, are made up. That's how all those little segments, they're from all of these people, right? And that's how you drill this down. Use your known relations to get back to them, okay? Here's an example of me and RM, right? This is what a profile looks like on Ancestry. If I was on that list I showed you previously and I clicked on her name, this is what would show up. You would see a tree, right, with her family members on it. If you notice, right, we have, a, we have all these names lit up in green on this side because this is how I'm related to her. Her father and my grandfather were brothers, right? Her and my father, of course, were first cousins because their dads were brothers. And I'm on the next generation. I'm her first cousin once removed. So this whole side of her family tree is exactly identical to mine. Now you're like, well, you could just test your dad. Well, no, I can't because my father died in 2001. So in order for me to replicate my father genetically, I had to choose his first cousins. I, and I had to test them for, for them to stand in my father's place genetically so that I could in some ways replicate him. I also did similarly with my half siblings, you know, where we only share my dad as a source of the relation. I tested my nieces because they picked up different DNA from my dad through my brother than I did, right? So if you pop the trees open, right? If you've got a tree, let the system work for you. See what matches in green. It will tell you the surnames that are on your tree and the surnames that are on your DNA matches tree that are similar, right? That's another clue, okay? Then there's another tab that's called shared matches, right? This is where the DNA matching happens. And you notice there are a lot of people who are decently high DNA matches between me and RM. Remember, this is through her father and through my father, her dad and or her dad and uh, my grandfather being brothers. So anyone that's in common with us is related to me through my paternal grandfather. It's just my grandfather's side. It's not through any other means, okay? And remember, when I'm looking at these folks, you see the names and you see the initials 
officials, but you should be looking at them once you figure out their relationships as whoever the common relation is. And in this instance, we notice same great grandparents, right? This second cousin is a daughter of the person whose profile I'm on. This person marked as a third person, third cousin is actually a second cousin, but she's on the lower end of the range of DNA that a second cousin shares with another second cousin. But our common relation are our shared great grandparents who are the same people, right? That are in common with RM, LM, and her. Okay. Now this is where it gets fun. James B. Sewell, his mother had three sets of children which means there's a half relationship. So anyone that I have in common with the descendants of those sets of children, our common relation is only through his mother, which is why you only see these people with one person. Easter Parker Williams is the mother of James B. Sewell and she's my great-great-grandmother. Anyone that I have in common with this DNA match and this one and this one and this one and this one all comes through her. That's the source of our relation. You see, I just drilled down, right? Paternal grandfather, that's the source of the relation here. Then moving forward, okay, paternal grandfather's parents. Paternal grandfather's parents, those are the common ancestors. Paternal grandfather's grandmother, grandmother, grandmother. Then we, uh, look, now there's another singular name. That's James B. Sewell's father. That's the source of that relation, right? I didn't test any of these people. DNA testing did not exist when these people were walking the earth. But through, right, testing specific family members who I've verified on paper and through DNA have a particular relationship with me, I've been able to identify which the source of the DNA of DNA is that I have with in common with other people. You can do the same thing on 23andMe, right? This is how your DNA relative screen looks, okay? Um, and so... With that, right, my mom and my grandmother are tested and notice, right, on 23andMe, it gives you the ability to set the relationships, right, where you see how I've got here, first cousin once removed. I had to change the relationship for it to say that. Without that, it would guess first cousin, second cousin, right? On 23andMe, you can change the relationships. So I went in and changed that, right? But all these people, remember, I'm looking at them, not so much as their names, but who they represent in my DNA, okay? Look at this example. Notice the majority of these matches are mother side, mother side, mother side. Remember, I told you, we have 100 people tested on just that one side, this particular grandmother. We have 100 people tested between 23andMe and Ancestry. Look for me in your results or one of them. Um, you might see us. Um, but there's a match here. Notice that doesn't have mother side. So then which side of the family is it on? Remember, my father's dead. My mother's living. All the rest of these matches are listed as mother side, but there's a match here that does not say mother side. That matches through my father. This is another of my father's first cousins through the opposite set of grandparents as the cousin that you just looked at on Ancestry, because remember my father's dead. So I tested his first cousin. So this first cousin on 23andMe represents my grandmother's family. The one that was on Ancestry represent my grandfather's tree. So let's click on my mom's profile so we can see what it looks like. And 23andMe is, they've organized the page so that you have to scroll down to the very bottom of the page to get to this information, right? And it will tell you, this is similar to the shared matches section um, on Ancestry. It'll give you a list of relatives and it says, you have 704 relatives in common with your mom. Of course, because half my DNA comes from her, right? One of them is my grandmother, right? And what you want to see is this shared DNA area. If you click that, it will take you to that comparison page that I showed you all earlier where it compares your DNA with the selected people where you get, you remember the purple bar and the orange bar? This will take you there where you can look at the chromosomal matching between you and your DNA matches, okay? And if we flip the perspective a little bit, right? This is just, this is a visual exercise that I'm giving you all so that you can kind of flip how you're thinking about this. You can't go into the system and change people's names. You can't do that. 
but think, just think along the lines of, of if you could, right? How should I really be thinking about looking at folks? All these people that are on this list that are in common between me and my mom, 90% of them are through my grandmother that was tested through her, her father's side of the family. That's our common relation. Or my grandmother who was tested, her, her parents, right? There are, there's a couple other folks that don't fit in that way. One that goes to another couple, which is here, who are the parents of this one person. These are my great, great grandparents. They're my grandmother's grandparents through her father, right? This other match that's in common with me and my mother only is through my mother's father, okay? When you've targeted tests or when you identify how people are related to you, it helps you scroll, you know, it helps you mine through this information so much more quickly. But if you only research your direct ancestors, you know, just your folks that you know, you'll miss all of this, right? So in this situation from 23andMe, that initial person that I showed you all on the list that's from my father's mother's side, he represents these six people. I had a whole other person that represented these six people on Ancestry, but it's the same family. Remember, macaroni and cheese is different. Somebody might have more mozzarella than you have Gouda, right? So this is why you, you pick different people to test. The other person was listed as MW. We only have this person in common because Marcus Hogan had two different wives. Remember, there was another half relationship. The person in common is just the wife. With the majority of the lion's share people on 23andMe all come from these relationships right? It's four different people that come from the same relationship, but there's one person that only comes from this one set of great grandparents, right? So everything from here forward, right, is right, right? From here to here, okay. But for everyone else, it's all those six people. So here's an example, right, of going up, out, and down, okay? When I was trying to figure out the origins of my grandfather, I had to look at patterns, and there are some of you who have asked questions like, well, I don't know who my father is, or I don't know who my grandfather is, or there's a mysterious person showing up. And what you need to do is you need to look at patterns. And what I mean by that is you need to see the same last names repeated in your DNA matches, right? If you keep seeing Hogan, 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 and all the people are from Rusk County, Texas, or from Limestone County, Texas, which these people are, um, or Chisholm. Right. You keep seeing these surnames, these locations and the same family trees repeated over and over again. That's a sign in the genetic genealogy spirit that those folks are related to. That's the common relation. You keep seeing Hogan's from Limestone County, Texas, and it's all the, the same people who are descended from James Hogan and Nancy Arrington. That's your clue that those two people are the common relation is because you keep seeing them over and over again. When you're organized, when you start going in and labeling your DNA matches, right, with different colors, this is sort of a next step after this particular webinar, then you can figure out like, oh, wow, okay, now I'm seeing it. Okay, so this person comes from Francis and this person comes from John. What I do is I do something visually so I can see, okay, I'm sharing DNA with folks that come from James Hogan and Mary Arrington. And out of their known children, I share DNA with all of their, from descendants of all of their kids. Now, if I turn down to, into their son, Marcus and his wife, Francis, and I've got her, his, their tree figured out, I match with descendants of Beulah, who then had a daughter, who then has a DNA match, right? I like to see the visual of who, who are all the people so that I can count them. It'll make a little bit more sense when you look at the next tree, right? So here we are on, on Marcus's profile. Remember, he had two different wives, and we share our, I share DNA with more descendants from the second wife than I do the first one because the person in common is Marcus, right? He has two sets of kids, two wives, right? If we match descendants from both wives, that means either the wives are related or that Marcus is the common relation, not the wives. Again, if somebody has two wives or two husbands and you share DNA with descendants from both of those relationships, either the wives are related or one of those people, the, the person who had the two relationships, right? is the person in common. And I like to label these folks, you know, the, who are the source of the relations. I like to label them with colors so I know out of his six kids, I shared, I shared DNA with seven, you know, <laughs> to add another child. 
I share a DNA with seven descendants and they come from four of his children, right? Some may be on the same family line, some may not, but you use the system that works the best for you. All right, now staying organized, right? There are um, several systems. People use spreadsheets. Um, they do the group labeling on Ancestry where you can assign colors um, and group people together in groups. Um, there's also a program called Gen Genome Mate Pro that I love, but there's a very huge learning curve with that because it's very, it's in some ways very hard to stay organized with this. Like not, like the genealogy is one aspect, but then to organize the actual genetic genealogy, that can get a little complicated too, especially if you start getting into this kind of deep. So I would suggest starting with a spreadsheet like Excel, numbers for Apple or even Google Sheets, um, you know, putting in, you know, who matches who and how, making sure you have your notes on Ancestry or even leaving notes on 23andMe for your matches once you've figured out how someone is related to you, maybe adding them to your tree, whatever you can to make sure that you can get back to your information much more quickly, right? And just to go through this really quick, um, this is an example of what the groups look like on Ancestry. And I'm going to bring this up a little bit closer, right? And you can label however you want, but I have them set up in sort of acronyms. Maternal grandfather is what MGF stands for. So anyone that's in that group comes from my maternal grandfather because I figured that out. Maternal grandmother, right? And you see a number after meaning that third generation, right? It comes from, from that, right? You can label these however you want. You see this one at the bottom says Patterson's Amite County, Mississippi. That's because I've identified, remember patterns, surname, pattern, Patterson. Location pattern, Amite County, Mississippi. I got a whole group of people that are from that area. How am I connected? Well, I know it's through my, my grandfather. It's through my dad's dad, but I haven't figured it out yet. So I put them all in a group until I can get to the place where I can figure it out, right? Here's an example using... TV families that we loved in the 80s, right? Just let's assume that Thelma Evans from Good Times decided she was going to do a, you know, family DNA project. And she tested her mom, Florida, her father, James, her brother, JJ, and her brother, Michael. And through their DNA results, they see the names of other people like Willis and Arnold Drummond, Alex Keaton, Alfonso Spears, Blair Warner, Wheezy Jefferson, and A.C. Slater. And they all share DNA with these people in varying amounts, right? Now, look at this. Willis and Arnold are brothers. Remember, they're from different strokes, okay? Right? Willis shares 1,750 Cinnamorgans with Florida. Arnold shares 1,900. Oh, there's a difference. But they're brothers, okay? But then, okay, let's keep going forward. James is married to Florida Evans. They're husband and wife. How is it that Willis doesn't share DNA with James but Arnold does. Could it be that Willis and Arnold have a different father? We know their mother, right? She asked in her, her final wishes for Mr. Drummond to take Willis and Arnold. They never said they had the same dad. Could, this, I, could, could you identify that they did? Using a spreadsheet will help you kind of see the irregularities like this, right? Notice Wheezy Jefferson is sharing a whole lot with Florida Evans. She's showing up like a first cousin, right? And there's a variance between what Michael shares with Wheezy, right? And JJ, it's a whole lot of a difference, right? That could be because of what's called recombination, right? What I've been referring to is the macaroni and cheese recipe, right? Maybe Michael has a little bit more Gouda than JJ has a little bit more mozzarella, right? Like that's, that's how this works. You get a clearer picture when you extract the information into a system that you can utilize where you can, you can, you know, make some insinuations or deductions and reasoning. Another tool that I love is called the Share CM Project. Um, this is developed by a good genetic genealogist friend of mine named Blaine Bettinger. It takes probability data from people submitting um, their, you know, relation, known relations to people. And it tells you when you put in the number of centimorgans shared, the probable relationships. When you enter in, um, you know, uh, 699, it says 69% of the time, somebody that shares that much DNA with another person is either a great grandparent, a great aunt or an uncle, a half aunt or an uncle, a first cousin, a half niece or nephew, a great niece or nephew, or a great grandchild. So 70% of the time, the relationship between the two of those people is that. 
30% of the time, it's other relationships. This is a great tool to have, especially if you don't quite know how someone fits in the family, but you have high matches so that you can say, okay, well, wait a minute. There's no way it's a great grandparent because this person's too young. So you can rule that out, right? So you can cross that off your list. You can say, nope, nope. Okay, now, could it be a great aunt or uncle? No, based on age. Mm -mm. Let's rule that out. So then now you only have three relationships. Is it a half aunt, half uncle, or half niece, right? Or is it a first cousin? All of that based on age and how the generations fall out in a tree or how they're plotted out in a tree. Right? The other thing I would say, of course, we're here with the library. Document your sources. Write down how you got to the conclusion. How did you get there? What did you find? What was your inference, right? I feel like for research, we need to really focus on, um, you know, making a hypothesis, right? Like this is, this is science, you know, make an educated guess, right? Make a thoughtful guess, right? And, and use the evidence to guide you as to where you need to go, but make sure you document it. You don't want to get to a place where you have done all the pattern looking and then you come back to it next week and you're like, wait a minute, what did I land on? Was Wheezy Jefferson the auntie or was she not? Dang it, I should have wrote it down. Write it down when you think about it, right? And to wrap up, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up this potential thing. And I think so many of us have seen this over the last few years um, on Black Progen Live. I've hosted a show on it this year where people are discovering um, information through, you know, autosomal DNA testing that they just weren't prepared for. And one of those things is dealing with non-paternal or non-parental events, meaning you found out that a parent that was supposed to be your biological parent is not who who it's showing it. You look at the DNA and you don't see any of the Johnsons or in the case with Thelma Evans and her family, she's not seeing any Evanses at all. Everyone is from her mother's side or a surname she has never even heard of. That typically is how that happens. Exercise care with this, especially if you are doing a DNA project, right? Meaning you've paid for the kits, you're testing specific people, you need to figure out your policies early, right? Know if you're dealing with somebody that has a suspicion um, about whether their parent is their parent, you know, and I hate seeing this on Facebook. Oh my gosh, it drives me crazy <laughs> when people are just spilling all the beans. I saw somebody um, recently where they, they had a cousin that they specifically wanted to test and, and, and the cousin joked, oh, well, what if I find out my dad's not my dad? Oh, that's not going to happen. And then guess what happened? She found out that the dad wasn't her father. So the person is on Facebook trying to figure out what to do. That's not the place to figure this out. Because <laughs> you wouldn't want somebody to do that with your business, right? So you need to learn when to get involved and not to. Know who you're dealing with emotionally, um, psychologically, right? If, if it's an elder that you have established is, is not connected to your family and it's as a result of DNA, you really need to determine if it's going to do more harm than good to tell them. Um, and, and some people opt for the, I'm not going to say anything until they ask. Um, some people tell right up front, but here's the thing. When you have people who are very skilled at genetic genealogy, um, and they know what to do, they can figure out how, if somebody has a situation where a parent is not who they think it is very quickly. Um, I have a cousin I've talked to, you know, I've talked about this publicly. He actually brought him on the show, um, him and two other folks to, to, to talk about their, you know, biological fathers or fathers not being who they were told they were. And, and I knew his father was incorrect based off of 20 centimorgans. I knew his father was not correct because of everyone I had in common with him. I was like, oh no, we know this side of the family. Either somebody has an extraneous child or your dad is this particular person. And he, 45 years old, found out that his father, who he was raised with his entire life, was not his dad. And people handle this just differently. So um, just a word of caution about that, a word to do no harm, a word, you know, a, 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 just to just, just, just take care of people. Don't be petty. You know, this is not the time to go and spread the gossip to other people in the family. You know, just really think about how you would want to be treated if you if you identify this information, um, because it, 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 it this is happening. It's so much more prevalent than people think. Right. Do no harm. Really do no harm.
um, and just seek to, to get answers. If somebody says they don't want you to find who the biological parent is, don't do it. Respect and honor their wishes, you know? But if their child says that they are curious, well, then you have to make a decision. But don't do it out of spite, you know, just, just really do it in the, in the good spirit of things. All right, so I know we went a little bit over, but um, I definitely wanna make sure I get to your questions. I'm gonna start with um, the first one. Um, Coco, she says, I'm trying to find out who is my mother's father. All right, so the first thing um, I have for you to answer that question is, have you tested, has your mother tested? If your mother is deceased, have you tested a sibling of yours or a sibling of hers? The reason why is if your mother is deceased, um, you can test one of her siblings, her known siblings, and the DNA that you share with that aunt or uncle would, you know, be the, the source of it would come from the shared set of parents that your mother and that aunt or uncle have. Now, if that aunt and your mother only share one parent, the DNA that they inherit or that they have together would only be from that one parent. The reason why you would want to test that aunt or uncle if your parent is deceased is remember, they're going to stand in the place of your grandmother, right? So anyone you have in common with them is going to be through the grandmother. But if, but if you're, you know, your aunt or uncle and your, your mother have the exact same set of parents, that aunt or uncle is going to stand, you know, proxy or stand in the place of those shared grandparents. Um, to me, it's sounding like, you know, like I said, you don't know who, who your mother's father is. So if you can test her, um, if you cannot test her, test one of her siblings, test yourself. If you have any siblings that you have through that mother, do the same thing and then use the process of, of elimination, right? If it's just a match that you have and not your mom or one of your siblings, if you have, you know, um, a couple concentrations of different um, sets of parents, then you know that's through your dad. If it's a match that you and a sibling have, um, or you are an aunt or an uncle through your mother have, then you know that it's through the shared grandmother. But if it's just a match that you have and a sibling has, or you and your mom has, that's a lead that it goes back to her biological father. Um, what if grandparents' children have different fathers? That's even better. <laughs> Remember, like I told you, I come from a blended family. So anyone that I have in common with my brothers or my sisters is going to be through the shared parent we have, right? And it works the same way with grandparents. So for you, if you have first cousins, but they're only through one grandparent, if you test them, then the DNA that you share with them and anyone else is only going to come from that one grandparent. If it's just a DNA match that you have by yourself, but not those first cousins, you know that it's from the opposite side of the family that they're related to you on. That's why I love half relationships, because you can just sever off half of a tree from being a, at the point of contention because they're not a relation to um, you and those folks together. Um, Ancestry has an uncle as a second cousin. The reason why is because she said, and let me finish reading the question. My mother's brother, same mother, different fathers. That's why. It's because it's a half uncle. It's not a full uncle. If it was a full uncle, it would show up as close family because grandparents and aunts and uncles, um, they share roughly around the same um, DNA. They can um, it's very close related. That's why it will be labeled close relation because the systems can't decipher whether or not it's an aunt or uncle or a grandparent. Um, and so because your mother has a brother, they have different fathers. Anyone you have in common with that uncle is related to you through your grandmother only. Anyone that you have in common just by yourself, right, without your uncle, either has to come from your dad or it has to come from your mother's father. Because remember, anyone in common with the uncle is, is the relation, the, the source of the relation comes from uh, your grandmother because she's the she's the source of, of the DNA. I don't know anything beyond grandparents on my dad's side. All right. Well, this is where DNA can can really work for you. Um, if you have anyone that you can test 
on your mother's side so that you can use them as a process of elimination regarding your father's side. Right? Like you want to be able to separate your matches into your maternal and paternal family. So test or identify relations on your mother's side. And then that way, when you are looking at your list and you can see, oh, okay, these people don't connect to that, those cousins on my mom's side. So this has got to be my father's side. And if that's the case, then you can drill down even further. Look at those patterns of, for those folks that just you have that you don't have in common with those matches or those cousins on your mother's side, right? Who, who are those people? What are the patterns you're seeing with the surnames or the last names, the family trees and the locations? Look at that repetition because that's your clue as to where to look and who to look at is when you keep seeing the same things repeated over and over and over and over again. And even if you don't have names for folks, that's still a clue. That's how we're able to identify birth parents for people um, who may not know them if they were adopted is by looking at the patterns, looking at the highest matches that you have and looking at the patterns of repetition between those last names, those locations and the family trees. And then from there, drilling down into, all right, who was old enough? Who was in the right place at the right time, right? And then you have a list of candidates who could be the parents. That's literally how it works. Um, let's see. If someone has listed the wrong spouse and children for my maternal grandmother on Ancestry's family tree, how can I alert them that it's incorrect? <laughs> Send a message. <laughs> Use the messaging system um, and explain your reasons why, right? Um, a lot of times people just copy bad information and the bad information just gets just copied over and over and over and over again. Um, and you may have all the proof in the world. You're like, please, hence, show that that marriage, you know, that marriage certificate that I uploaded or whatever. I would send them a message and just say, you know, this is wrong. Um, you're throwing through lines off. That's another portion of ancestry. Um, and I didn't get into that because that can sometimes get messed up by it, trees that have bad facts or bad research, right? You know, that has a mother dying before the child was born. Um, I would just message them and tell them and, and maybe even potentially stick a note um, in the notes area of your ancestors on your tree that says, I have looked at this information and, you know, Mary Sue is not his wife. Um, and that's, you know, that's not him on this census. There were two men with the name Harry Easley living in Halifax County, Virginia. One lived in this township and the other one lived in that one. And one died here and one died there. You know, you want people, you want it to be clear to people that you've done your due diligence and that you've, you know, that you can, you've, you've made a sound um, statement that, that these are two different people. But a lot of, a lot of times it's people just copying bad information from trees. Any other questions you guys have? You asked in some good ones. Okay. I'm trying to help my paternal half uncle um, find his biological mother. I've identified two sisters as potential mother. One of the sisters has son has done FTDNA, but I can't get my uncle to upload. Ooh, Ooh this is a tough one. Oh man. Um, maybe see if you can get the 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 sister son to test on on 23 and me okay so the grandson is also on 23 and me oh okay oh so but here's the thing so here's here's the here's where you have to break down this family if you've got two sisters who are the who are the potential mom and one of their son is tested right that would make that son a half sibling or a first cousin to your uncle. Now, you've got to make sure you vet that these two sisters shared the exact same parents. If they did, that means we're dealing with full relationships. So that means that that son um, should match your uncle either as a half sibling or as a first cousin. And there's a difference in the range of DNA. If you use that shared CM project that I told you about, when you're doing the DNA comparison between your uncle and the son of, of one of these sisters, it'll be very obvious whether or not it's a half sibling or a first cousin. And then there you have your answer. Because if there's only two sisters and these are the only people that are the possibilities for the parent, then you know it's the other one. If that son shows up with a range of DNA that falls into a first cousin, you automatically know this is, you know, 
this is a uh, first cousin versus a sibling. Your answer, in fact, your answer is right there. If the grandson's on 23 and me, and you, it was the grandson, oh, it's not a son. I need that son to upload. <laughs> Because the problem is once you start getting out generationally, it's not so much that the patterns are hard to see or easy. It, they aren't as easy to see, but they can be with close relationships like this. I need you to buy the um, the father. I need you to buy him a 23andMe kid and just say, look, I just need you to test here or put your uncle on FTDNA. And then that way you can do the comparison again to see if it's, but but even still, if it's a half nephew or it's a first cousin once removed with this grandson who's on 23andMe, it would be very obvious, right? Because the DNA range between a, a half uncle and a half nephew versus a first cousin once removed and a, you know, a uh, first cousin once removed is, is drastically different. Um, you know, my, my nieces are half nieces and we share like 700 centimorgans roughly. Right. But with, with each other, their half siblings, it's, it's like 15 it, or it's, you know, it's higher. It's much higher. Um, so you, you have your answer. I expect a report by the end of the night. <laughs> I would hope so. Um, because your answer is right there. Um, with that grandson, it should be, unless you have a, a community that intermarried a lot. But assuming you don't, your answer is already there. Thank you, Debbie, for the wonderful information. I hope, you know, my, my, my hope and plan is that you stay up all night long using what I taught you. I want you to be up all weekend, all night. Do not get any sleep. Um, you know, because I really, I always want whatever I teach and explain to people, I want them to be able to grasp it so that they can use it. I don't want it. I don't just want this to sit there and be entertainment for you. I want you to actually make fines and, and, you know, um, propel your project forward. Any other questions that you all may have? How can I be reached? Who is NikaSmith.com? Or you can just Google me. There's really, there's pretty much only me <laughs> with my name, Nick with an A. Um, oh, thank you for the nice comment, Miss Janet. I wish I was there in person with you guys. Um, I mentioned that earlier, um, but you know, eventually we'll be We'll all be back together again and be able to congregate. Any other questions? What other source can I use to find my paternal grandmother's sister, spouse, and children? Ooh, so the spouse is a different scenario because you wouldn't share DNA with them. So you got to go traditional genealogy or you have to test their descendants and then, then use the whittling down process that I explained. Um, you, one of the biggest pitfalls for people with genealogy is they only stay on one website. Um, and for me, I'm a go where the records are. So if you um, are just primarily looking on ancestry, maybe you need to expand your search out to family search, or maybe you need to start looking at stuff locally if you can get there, or maybe look to see if they offer research services, or you can pay for someone to look locally, meaning the state archives where they lived or at the county or parish courthouse, any of those places. Um, there are certain states in the country that you can't say, oh, but well, they just didn't exist and they don't have anything unless you actually go there. Mississippi is one of those states. Don't ever say that, oh, I couldn't find. Nope. You got to go to Mississippi and their archives. They really hold up everything super tight. When you get there, you find amazing stuff, but they don't let a lot out of the state. So that's one of those places you absolutely have to go to. Um, you can't, I'm telling you, trust me, I'm a researcher in Mississippi enough to know, don't say you can't find it. Um, one good example, we were looking for, um, a, um, a person that was from, uh, Chickasaw County, Mississippi. And, you know, we were kind of striking out on, on census records and other stuff. And so I live with, you know, within driving distance. So I went down there, I was able to find a slave holder. Didn't have any of that information online, had no leads until I went and I looked locally. So I highly suggest that, highly suggest that. Any other questions? North Carolina, um, a lot of, North Carolina's got some incredible stuff on Ancestry. Um, you guys have got, you know, full scale uh, death certificates. You've got marriages, you've got the census, right? State archives, think about historical societies. You know, uh, Google, just Google, look for books. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, you guys are one of the lucky states 
actually. <laughs> North Carolina is. Um, oh, yeah. Diana, mm-hmm. She said, I guess I'm also going to Mississippi. Yeah, Lord, don't rule. I'm telling you, Mississippi is, is good once you get there, but don't rule out that, don't say that people just didn't exist because I'm telling you, they just don't let anything out. Georgia, um, they've got some good stuff, but that might be another place where you might need to actually hit the ground running and go there. Um, the state archives have some decent things like death certificates. Um, remember you all, don't just stay on one site, right? And even if you think, that a collection of death certificates, because the date looks the same, that it's the same collection on two different sites. It may be five more years on one versus the other. And that may be the difference between why you're finding something and not. Um, grandfather was an immigrant and to the best of my knowledge, the only one from his family to come to the US. Will DNA test help me um, find the names? Absolutely it can. Have you ordered his naturalization papers? Do you know where he came in? If you, um, if he, depending on his age, right? If he's on the U.S. Census, there's an immigration cat, uh, column on there that will tell you when they immigrated and when they were naturalized. And then you can then look, you know, locally, look at the county level for for their naturalization. Some of the naturalization papers have been digitized and they're available on Ancestry, and some of those are just incredible because they even have the pictures of the people on them. Um, like their actual passport photos. Um, they're so good. But otherwise, for naturalizations, you can also go to the to the local level, you know, look at the, the county courthouse. With DNA, right, people from all over the world are testing. So you don't know if some of his relatives from Italy or, or, or from Slovenia or wherever else they were living, right, have already tested. Some of those folks may have already may have come stateside and you guys don't even know that they're here. So I suggest you DNA test. All right. No other questions? You guys are asking great stuff. All right, Suzanne, do I turn it back over to you? Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you for the talk today. It was wonderful. And I hope that um, I I'm positive our participants um, got a lot out of it and they can work on their own DNA projects. So good, good. Yeah. All right. So I think we can. Uh, we can have the host uh, end the webinar, and uh, I'm just so glad you all were able to make today's program.